And that's basically what all this boils down to is new life. Jesus gives us new life. And when we get new life, here's a trick. You guys want, how many guys are into tricks? No? How many guys are in, how many guys are into something that changes life? How many guys want something good to happen? How many guys want to live in blessing and anointing in authority? You ready? If you live in the new life, you don't have to live in the old. That's the principle. If we live in the new life, we don't have to live in the old. My old life is full of garbage. How many guys know that there's demons in your old life? A lot of those are ourselves, right? How many guys, how many guys grew up with stinking thinking? You know, the problem is right between our ears. Mike Packy says, I'm going to, pretty much what I point at, I'm going to focus on. Ready? He goes, I walk around like this. <laughs> but here's the truth. Jesus came to set us free. And a lot of what he came to set us free from is us. Do you know that? And when we live in his freedom, then we taste victory for all eternity. So follow along with me in Matthew chapter 28. And we're going to read about the resurrection. All right? We're going to talk about this new life. And if, and if you can judge um, kind of like uh, what God's going to do based by the attacks that come our way, he's getting ready to do a lot of things this morning. Man, ran out of water, had sound issues. Uh, mic issues, not Mike Packy, but other mic issues. And it's been difficult. Not Mike Lawless. Well, yeah, he. We we'll talk about Mike Lawless later. Uh, John chapter, or sorry, Matthew chapter twenty-eight. Almost had you in the wrong book. It's it's before Revel. It's before Genesis and after Revelation. All right, Matthew twenty-eight. Now, after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the woman, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here, for he has risen. Hallelujah. He, as he said, come, see the place where the Lord lay. Then go quickly and tell the disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. And behold... Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brethren to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. While they were going, behold, some of the guard went into the city and told the chief priests all that had taken place. And when they had assembled with the elders and taken counsel, they gave a sufficient sum of money to the soldiers and said, Tell the people his disciples came by night and stole him away while they were asleep. And if this comes to the governor's ears, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So they took the money and did as they were directed. And this story has been spread among the Jews to this day. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain, to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Memory verse today. Matthew 28, 5 through 6 says this. But the angel answered and said to the woman, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come and see the place where the Lord lay. 
So can you imagine this? Can you imagine the whole city being in an uproar over this one guy, Jesus, and now he's dead, the disciples being distraught, worried in doubt, expected to go to the tomb and find him there, and yet he was not in the tomb. He is risen. And it wasn't the fact that he was stolen because he was, if he was stolen, he wouldn't be able to appear physically to all the disciples. And so this Jesus came, and he shows us new life. Can you say new life today? Because when we receive Jesus, we don't have to live in the old. We get to live in the new. And this new life that he provides is a spiritual life resurrected with power and authority. The spiritual life has a future and a hope. So as we look at Jesus, we shall become like him, the Bible says, once you receive him. So you have no authority without Jesus. The Holy Spirit doesn't have authority come and dwell in you and inspire you and regenerate you unless Jesus gives him that authority. So the answer is you have to accept Jesus to have authority and power. So we can have power in this world, but this, the power of this world does nothing to get us into heaven. Hello? The power of this world does nothing to get us into heaven. The power of this world is nothing compared to God. The power of this world will fall short in comparison to the goodness and the glory of God. And so you and I get this power today. First principle, new life. Our salvation is dependent upon the resurrection of Jesus being true. Our faith is empty without the resurrection, 1 Corinthians 12, 15, 12 through 19. That's the sermon I preached this morning at sunrise. If Christ did not rise from the dead, then we have no point in gathering and even professing faith because then we are of no use. We are of no value, and our religion would be worthless without the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And the resurrection of Jesus Christ gives us everything that we need as Christians because in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, he, we see our eternal value. And that value was completed. It was like the payment that was paid up and it was accepted by God. That's what it means to be justified. How many guys would like to go back to the Garden of Eden and slap Adam and Eve? Come on. How many guys would like to slap Adam and Eve and get some sense into those people? Man, if they could have just gotten it, we wouldn't have been in this mess. Right? I would like to. You know? How many of you guys think it's the woman you gave me, God? We'll talk after we're church. How many guys know that Adam blamed his wife? Wrong. He didn't blame his wife. He blamed God. It's the woman you gave me, God. He blamed God for the outcome. How many of you guys go through life in this old nature, and when we don't get what we want, we blame God? We shake our fist at him. We become mad at him because we didn't get what we want. Yet, if God gave us what we want, we'd be absolutely miserable having it. You know, God, I want this girl. This is a girl that touched my heart. Thank you, Jesus, I didn't end up with her. Hallelujah. Because if I had ended up with one, I would have missed out on so much more. And a lot of you guys can say amen because you know what God has given you is a prize value. Amen. So, where was I? Oh, yeah, the resurrection. Dependent. It's dependent upon it being true. So, I looked at this, and I go, well, how's the resurrection true? Well, we'd like to think, well, the resurrection's true because I can feel it. It's a thought. And that's true. It is a thought. It is, it, is, it is a witness by the Holy Spirit that Jesus rose from the dead. Amen? But factually and historically, it's a, it, it is true as well. Here's why. The disciples were willing to lay down their life for what they saw. Now, a lot of us can go in a religious system, and we can try to lay down our life for an idea, right? But who's going to lay down their life for a known lie? Not just an idea, but a known lie. None of us, right? Yet, the disciples were willing to suffer the worst deaths imaginable because of what they saw. What they saw, not just what they thought. Ooh what they saw, what they experienced. When Jesus shows Thomas, he goes, hey, take a look at me. It wasn't the fact that Thomas had an idea. Thomas got to handle him after he died, and he was raised from the dead. So there's that witness. We also have the witness of, of people that were actually anti-Christian. 
writers, Roman historians, and Jews alike that actually tried to put down Christianity, and yet in their writings they were hostile to Christianity. They spoke about the one who was resurrected, Jesus Christ. Ooh. And then the Bible says, hey, you know what? This Jesus appeared to 500 at once at one time. 500 people at one time. And yet when this was written, a lot of those people were alive to refute what was written, and they did not refute it. Ooh. And then he said he walked around for 40 days and 40 nights. 40 days and 40 nights he walked around showing himself, revealing himself to those around him. Wow. This Jesus is real. The resurrection is fact. So much so that many years later, Christians are still going to truth to try to disprove the resurrection. They're doing all sorts of research to disprove the resurrection. Because if they disprove the resurrection, they can bring Christianity down. Lee Strobel. If he's here, Bill Donahue, where is he at? And Bill came to reconnect with God, trying to disprove the resurrection, only to reveal that the facts spoke for him, for themselves. And finally, how many of you know the resurrection is real because he's in you? And he has declared the re his reality in you. You know how that comes? Changed life. If we don't have a changed life, then we have to question, is the reality of Christ in me? That's truth. Amen? I know you guys, don't, we all don't want to hear that. We like, to, we like just want to go to church to feel good. And I'm sorry, this is not the church. I want to go to church to hear the truth because the truth sets me free. Feeling good can keep me in a lie. So what do I do? I have to look at the resurrection. You know what else? If the resurrection's true, guess what? Jesus is still alive. And if he's still alive, then, then I need to be responsible and accountable for my life. We don't want to preach that stuff. But the truth is, is that when we see Jesus, we shall be like him. And if he's alive and he's walking and he's in heaven, then we need to be careful in the way we live because we cannot squander our lives for ourselves. We got to invest it back in his kingdom. Guess what? How many of you guys know this? He invested his life for yours so that you return the favor and invest your life for him. That's why the Bible says we live for him who died and rose again. No investment. No payoff. You know that? No investment, no payoff. But here it gets worse. No investment, you have to pay the price. Eternity in separation with God. I like this, Josh McDowell. Paul the Apostle recounted that Jesus appeared to more than 500 of his followers at one time, the majority of whom were still alive and could confirm what Paul wrote. Wow, that's evidence. How many of you guys ever had miracles happen in your life? God performed miracles. Yet the world would say, you know what, that's just a coincidence. But when they continue to happen over and over and over again, isn't it evidence that God is here and he's working miracles and he's able to do it today? People want to know why there is no power in the church. Because there's no evidence that God's doing a work in the church because people don't come and they don't submit their lives to him where he could be glorified. And if he's glorified, guess what? He'll do greater things. How many of you guys want greater things? Submission is the, the key to greater things. Submission to God where he can use you and he can be glorified is the key to greater things. And the resurrection is such a greater thing, Paul couldn't even describe it. You know how powerful the resurrection is? Jesus' own brothers and sisters radically transformed their lives because of the resurrection. Before that, they were looking at Jesus as just a nice guy. And they ridiculed him. But after the resurrection, they were like, whoa, this guy is something else. He's more than a man. He's God Almighty. That's what the resurrection gives us. Jesus gives us a new identity. We share in Jesus' sufferings, but we will also share in his resurrection. Here's what new life gives us, a new identity. Now, my old life 
My, my life that I was born into in this world, my natural man, has an identity. You know, sometimes it was a uh, liar, <laughs> cheat. Sometimes it was uh, no good, scum. Oh, I'm just talking about some of the things that I heard from my own father. Coming out now, I'm hitting ground. Sometimes it was fat because I was chunky when I was a kid. Sometimes dumb or ignorant. How many of you guys have heard of ignorant? You were ignorant. And then I thought if I really got to be somebody, I would hear something different in my own head. So then I started being successful as the world defines success. And guess what? Those same voices were still going off because those voices were linked to my past and they were linked to my natural birth and they were linked to my old identity. My old identity, I ha I, I, you know how I measure my old identity? I pull out my wallet and there's my driver's license. That represents who I am, right? But that doesn't represent who I am in Christ, does it? That doesn't, those names that you recall doesn't represent who you are in Christ. And it's important that we focus on the new man because the new man will replace the old. How many guys heard that you were no good growing up, that you'll never amount to anything, and you still have those voices going off in your head? And if you let them consume you, that's all you'll ever be. But we don't have to live that way. The resurrection gives us a new promise, a new hope. It gives me an identity with Jesus Christ. You know who I am in Christ? I'm not an enemy with God anymore. I'm a saint. God looks at me like I've never sinned. How's that possible? I sin every day. It's because when you sin, the payment for your sin was still paid for for over 2,000 years ago when Jesus died on the cross. And the effective work of that payment was shown to be acceptable when he rose from the dead. So now that he rose from the dead, I have an identity with him. God looks at me as a son, a saint. Somebody's pure. Somebody's holy. And even though I don't see myself that way, that doesn't prevent God from seeing me that way. And here's why. How many guys go to the thrift shop and see junk? <laughs> but your wife sees treasure. And, and you know how you know your wife sees treasure? Because your checkbook reveals that. She's seeing lots of treasure today. Well, I go into a thrift store. I can walk through it in five minutes and go, I'm ready. Amen. But you take me to Bass Pro. Woo! Four hour minimum, baby. We don't have enough money to spend. Go to this gun case, ooh, binoculars, clothes. I could spend all day in there. And even though I can't buy it, I'm fantasizing about it. My mind's going there, right? I lost my place. Okay, now where? <laughs> I was thinking about it. Treasure. Here's why. When I go into a, a thrift shop or if I was going to a junkyard with cars, I would see something as it is. Do you know that? That's why it's junk to me. I would see it as it is. I go to a junkyard, and there's this old 30s car. I would see junk because I look at it as it is. How many guys, when you look in the mirror, you see junk because you see yourself as you are, and you think God sees you the same way? Here's the reality of it. If you were a car restorer and you went into the junkyard or you you're, you're, you're uh, saw a treasure when you went into the thrift shop, you wouldn't see it as it is. You would see it in what it would become. And that image would be planted in your mind. And that's what you would see every time you see this object, right? So God doesn't see us as we are. God sees us as we will become perfect and complete in him. And that's why God can speak those things of us, that we're sons and that we're saints and that we're children of the most high God. We're kings and priests. And we are part of the greatest inheritance that will ever be that we are co-heirs with Christ. Wow, that's powerful. So then when I hear those voices and, I, and, I, and people call me names, guess what? That doesn't represent my identity. That was somebody that's in the past. That was my old man. I have somebody new and complete and whole. And that's who I am. 
That's who we are when we come in alignment with him. He gives us his righteousness, his call, his identity. So God doesn't see me like this. God sees me like he sees Jesus. So when, like the Mount of Transfiguration or the baptism of Christ, the voice came down from heaven and he says, Behold my beloved and son in whom I am well pleased. Do you know that God says that about you when you have Jesus Christ? That's our identity. I'm a beloved son in whom he is well pleased. It's, it's, really, it's really humbling when you hear that, especially when you grew up in a, in a place where maybe your father wasn't always pleased with you. And that's all you wanted to do is hear his voice saying, you know, son, I'm proud of you. Watch this. How many guys can relate to that? Be real. That's all you wanted is to have your dad say that you were, he was proud of you. And yet, here, here's what I believe that goes on in heaven. It says the accuser of the brethren. Satan is accusing us night and day before God. And you know what? I'm guilty. I was those things. But Jesus stands in my place and declares me righteous, right? And I bet you Satan keeps accusing me. And God says, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. What you say, Satan, is not true because he has a new identity. It may be true of his past, but it's not true of his present or his future. Woo! It might be true of my past, but it's not true of my present or my future because I have a new identity. So I believe that the new names that we get in heaven will reflect our true identity. You know what my name represents? Just my identity, but it doesn't represent my character and who I truly am, does it? Does your name represent who you truly are? No. God knows who you truly are, and he gives you a name to reflect your true nature and character. That's powerful. I can't wait for my new name. Maybe it's righteous and holy. Maybe it's the guy has a great voice when he sings. Because I've been transformed, hallelujah. Hey, maybe it's the guy who has long hair and flowing. I long, you know what? I got to tell you, I'm vain. Anybody else vain in here? When you look at yourself, you're, you guys ever been vain looking at yourself? Come on, ladies. We know you paint it. There's a reason why. <laughs> vain, right? So one of the things that make me vain is when I watch the sermons, you know what I'm looking for? I'm looking at me, how I look. Boy, I've lost a lot of weight. Does that reflect that on the TV? And one of the things I'm very vain about is actually the lack of hair. It's so insignificant. And there's so many people in here that reflect the same problem I have. You know, it, you know what they, we used to call this guy? We used to call him Shekinah. Because his head would reflect the Shekinah glory of God. And he almost polished that thing. It was like he waxed it and polished it. It would really shine. Amen. <laughs> but that doesn't represent what I'm going to be. And in God, I am perfect. And in God, you need to hear this. You're perfect. Not what you do, but who you are because Christ came and gave you new life so you don't have to live in the old. Hallelujah. That is something, something that we should spend the rest of our lives praising God for. Wow, that's good, man. My wife must have put together this message because it's actually making sense. The great exchange. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. 2 Corinthians 5.21. This is the greatest exchange. You guys ever heard of replacement theology? I'm into replacement theology. Not in the same way that it's described. I believe that he replaced my sins for his righteousness. He replaced my brokenness for his holiness. He replaced my emptiness to be filled with the Holy Spirit and have a purpose in life and a purpose and a future and a hope in him. He did all that by the great replacement. He came and bore my sins so I can be pleasing to him. How many guys are tired of carrying your own weight? Not physically. If you are physically, try to lose it. It's helped me a lot. 30 pounds, man. I'm happy. 
two pant sizes. I'm putting them on the time, and I'm just checking to make sure that, you know, I told you I was vain, making sure I'm not gaining weight again. But how many of you guys are carrying the burden and the stress of life with you every day, and it's wearing you out? And we're trying to fix ourselves to please other people and to please God, and it's wearing us out. And we're putting on a front, and it's wearing us out. Guys, can you guys identify with that? Guess what? We don't have to identify with that any longer. We can identify with him, and we can be set free because he carries it, and he replaced it. And if I carry it, it's only a matter of my own choosing. Does that make sense? I know that you're telling me that I'm choosing to do this. Yeah, I am. You're telling me I'm choosing worry and doubt and suffering. Yes, oftentimes. We all suffer, but we can choose whether or not it has control. How am I doing that? By not surrendering it to God. By not living in the new life. That's how we choose it. By constantly picking it up. You know the hardest thing to do in life? Not pick it up. Especially you guys who fix things, right? You see a mess on the floor, you women, what do you want to do? My wife can't stand it, man. I'm like, leave it there. We'll get it later. You can see her. She's like, Argh. Nina's the same way. I'm going to get it. Or, or guys, you see a problem with a vehicle, and, and, and you got to take care of it. You can't just ignore it, right? Well, we do the same thing with problems in our lives. We try to take care of it, and it's not ours to carry. you got to let it go. you got to let it go. You, got, you can't pick it up. Our new identity gives us new promises. We are no longer sinners but saints because our sins are forgiven. God shows us his love, and we are children of God and co-heirs, and our destination is secure in heaven. You know, without Jesus, you don't have security in where you're going. With Jesus, guess what? You'll never die. What do you mean? My body dies. We call it transformation. You'll just be taken to heaven just like that. To be absent from the body is what? To be present with the Lord. Wow, that's a great promise. You mean I don't have to fear death? Nope. Because I know where I'm going, where I die. Jesus proved that. Because when they went to the tomb, it was empty. And I shall be like him. And if Jesus is alive, so I shall be alive too. And if Jesus is resurrected, I will be resurrected. And if Jesus was re is glorified, we shall be glorified with him. Woo! Can you imagine that? Satan's trying to paint your life full of darkness. You're like, take that and just put your glory, put God's glory all upon him. He'll leave you alone. You know why? Because he wants you to focus on the darkness, not on the light. So I shall be like him. So let's go back to this sins are forgiven. You know the greatest thing about communion is once a month I can come take the cup and I can recognize something. And taking the cup and the bread... I recognize what he did over 2,000 years ago. And it says that my sins have been perfect and complete, forgiven. So every time I feel like I've messed up or I can't come to God or I can't do anything pleasing enough and I'm bearing all this weight, I can come to the communion table and I go, oh, he's already forgiven me. I receive that. I can walk from here free, free from sin, knowing what he paid for. You know how powerful that is? You know, you guys ever walked with a big heavy backpack on? You know, after a while it weighs you down, and then finally you get to shed that thing, and it's like, woohoo, 50 pounds off my back. That's what Jesus did for us. We don't have to carry it. Free, because he forgave us. Children, I like that. I like that because... I'm going to switch to order in this. If we're children, guess what? We're the object of God's love. How many of you guys know that you didn't do anything to deserve God's love? He gave it to you freely. You couldn't be good enough to get it, right? You can't be bad enough to lose it. You mean I just messed up? God doesn't look at me with... Any less love? Nope. His love is unconditional. You mean I can get up and be renewed in it every single day? 
how, then how do you feel or express God's love? How do you know? Well, it's not a feeling, although the feelings of God's love comes and goes. It's not just in being um, around church people that tell you you're wonderful because that comes and goes, especially when you do one thing wrong in church and you'll be remembered by that most of your life. Those things come and go. No, the love of Christ was shown to us on the cross that's eternal because he bore the scars for all eternity. And when I look at the cross and I see the reality of the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ, I see God's love, even though I don't feel it, even though it's not being expressed to me presently, I can know for a fact that it's there. Did you always feel your parents' love? Really? How did it feel when they swatted you? How did it feel like when you got grounded? How many guys like getting grounded as a kid? Your parents loved you, but they grounded you. I wish the teenagers were in here. They would like to hear that one. I'm going to ground you because I love you. You know what? You'll get the death stare on that one. You'll get the death stare on that one. So here's the thing. God showed his love to us when we were yet sinners. We didn't earn it. And yet when we receive God's love, we can't leave it. How do you know that for a fact? Because it says in Romans chapter 8, nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. Not even going back and using. Not even committing adultery. Not even the things I just said to my spouse on the way to church this morning. Not even a broken relationship or a broken marriage. Those things don't declare to us God's love. The cross does. Aren't you glad? How many of you guys messed up coming into church this morning? Come on. How many of you guys had pure thoughts coming to church this morning? Come on. Because the Bible says you start you start in your thought process before you commit it to action. You know, if if you could read my thoughts, you would never want me to be the pastor. <laughs> hey, I can point the finger back at you guys too. If I could read your thoughts, we'd all be in a world of hurt. And some of us are more expressive than other people. You know, some people are hard to read. Like he's not here, so I'm going to throw him. Dan Castile is hard to read. You can't tell Dan is making a joke, and all of a sudden, at the end of, at the end of something, he kind of gives you a smirk. I'm very easy to read. Sometimes too easy, because I'm driving down the road, and my wife's looking at me going, what? <laughs> or she's making dinner, and I give her that. She goes, I haven't even made it yet, and you don't like it. But the truth of the matter is God shows his love for us on the cross, not in how we feel or how others may even express it. So you guys like God's love? I don't like it. I love it. You know why it's so powerful? Because if I receive God's love and that's where my life is built on, then I don't need other people to express love to me to be fulfilled. You know what? That's cool. Well, that's cool. I'm free from their manipulation control trying to find love. That's powerful. You know how many you know how many times we manipulate other people by a show of affection or love? All the time. Huh? All the time. Well, I'll do this for you cuz I love you. What are you going to do for me? How many of you guys get manipulated by other people that way? But if I'm truly and dwell with the love of Christ, then I'm going to give love without having to receive love, and I'm free to give it without their response. That's powerful. So you don't want to respond to me? Don't matter. I'm going to show you more love because I don't need you to respond for me to give it away. That's freeing. That's freeing, especially in homes because, you know, family members can manipulate. They can control you know, like your kids, when they don't get what they want, don't they throw a fit? How many of you guys ever seen a two-year-old in a thrower? Throwing a fit because you didn't give it to them. Well, we don't need it. And then finally, heirs with God. And I'll just really quick go over that with you. That means that we get everything in the inheritance that Jesus gets. If Jesus is the Son of God, 
When the Bible says firstborn, he's not talking about like Jesus was a created being born into this world. What he's talk, what he's talking about is the firstborn, like being a firstborn child at that time, you would receive the full inheritance of the Father. That's what it's talking about. So you and I get to share in the full inheritance of the Father like firstborn children. We get to be co-heirs with Christ. Can you imagine that? Hey, hey, Jesus owns the galaxy. I get to share in that. You mean I get to tell stars what to do? That I don't know. That's kind of a cool thought. I never thought about that before. That's awesome, man. No, not star. I said stars. Don's wife's name, Star. And she, let me tell you, she tells Donnie where to go and what to do. Because you know why? Because love declares that I will serve, not be served. Isn't that true? Right? And if you guys really want to know the order of my home, it's God first. Amen? Then Pastor Kevin, and I'll tell you how. Let me ask my wife to see if it's something I want to do. You guys got it? No, you know how it works? When God's first and the two of you work together to instrument, implement his plans in your life and through the lives of your children. That's how it works. Who, who has final authority? Maybe me. You know why? Because I have final responsibility. And if I don't do it right, guess what? I have a higher call. Doesn't mean that I'm in any superior position. You know where God took the rib to make Eve? Right from Adam's side. It's side by side. Not above and beneath. And when it functions that way, guess what? It's a representative of Christ in the church. No wonder there's an attack on marriage. Our new life will put down our old life. If we walk in the spirit, we will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So this is what the resurrection declares for me. I don't have to live the same way ever again. I don't have to live in the same disappointments ever again. I might have to go through life, but it doesn't have to control me ever again because I know where I get my authority. I know where my future is, and I know what my plan is. And my plan is to give him glory and give back everything that he's given to me. And the more I live in that, the less I want to go and revisit the same garbage over and over again and be consumed in it. Come on. The less likely I'm going to be controlled by what other people say. I don't have to listen to it. I don't have to jump in there and be a part of gossip. I don't have to let people put me down anymore thinking that that is my place. That is a lie. I don't have to let finances control me. Because guess what? Building up my kingdom in here isn't going to matter compared to eternity. See, when you put it in the right place, then guess what? We're free. And whom the sun sets free is free indeed. So then... Now I have a new life. I don't have to go back to the old. Here, here's something that somebody needs to hear. Guess what? You don't have to fix yourself for God to love you. You don't have to get it all together. How do I fix this thing that I'm doing? By living in the new life and connecting and growing with God, and he'll help you overcome it. You know the greatest thing about getting connected with God? is he fulfills me. You know what losing weight is? It's not my purpose in life. It's a byproduct. You know what getting off addiction is? It's not your purpose. It's a byproduct to a relationship with God. You know what becoming a better spouse or becoming a better father or mother is? It's not your purpose. It's a byproduct of growing in Jesus Christ. You know what being a better person is? It's a byproduct of growing in a relationship to Jesus Christ. So this is where I'm going to jump on the church. Okay? You don't point people back to their old lives and tell them to get, get it taken care of because you're feeding them back to the problem. And we were famous about that as a church. Come into church. Come as you are. And then they walk in the door and we point it to them and we say, you got to fix this, 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 and that in order to come in and we can embrace you. How many of you guys have ever experienced that in a church? Come on. They're telling you you have to get fixed up and cleaned up first. 
But that's not the answer. The answer is come as you are and grow in Christ and he'll take care of the mess. And then think how free I am. I don't have to decide what people are going through. I just have to get them growing in the Lord. He'll take care of it. Guess what? I, I don't have to be the sin cop. Woo, 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 woo. Infringement. I saw you cut somebody off in traffic. We're going to talk about this Sunday morning at church. By the way, be careful when you talk to me. It might become a message. But here's the thing. I don't have to. I don't have to go say, you know what? What do you have in your cupboards? Ooh. You know, that's a sin. <laughs> or like we, what we do in the church. You know what? That's not a sin, but I'm going to make it a sin because I'm going to add to the word of God. You can't drink that. You can't touch that. You can't handle this. The Bible says that's demonic. That aspect's demonic. You know, I, you know what I, my job is? Let's grow with Jesus and watch what he does in changing your life and the transforming the formation that takes place because the old is getting taken away because you're dwelling in the new. And the new has new hopes and dreams. And the new has fulfillment. And the new has a destination. And the new has victory. And the new is somebody that God has created, created for perfection. What do you want to do? Go back to the old, which is inferior, or live in the new, which is eternal? That's why new life matters. And you tell people to grow in God and you'll grow out of sin. You try to take care of sin on your own, you're going to get yourself more in sin because if you could, you'd pat yourself on the back with pride because you were able to take care of it. You ever done that? I would rip my own arm off to pat myself on the back. That's how prideful I could be. And if I could take care of something, something on my own, I wouldn't need God. And neither would you. And then if I did do it on my own, boy, boy, would I make a show of it. Guess what? I did. And that in itself is sin. So if we tell people to take care of it on their own without God, they're sinning by doing that. But if we tell them, look, this is who God is. This is what he's done for you. He gave his life for you so that you can have life with him. He took away all your sin and that past life to give you a new one. And he's given you this new life with power and victory, even over death. And you can live with purpose because of what he's done. Now, your life just needs to respond to his. That's what grace does. It's response. You know what worship is? Giving back to God what he's already given to me. So I'll, t I'll tell you a little bit about myself. I'm really not that good. Well, I had a low life full of failure, almost broken marriage. My wife had to divorce papers. Looking for, looking for my life to be fulfilled in what I had. You know, if I had a big pickup and, a, and some good guns and, you know, a lot of country music, I thought my life was just right. And then the more you listen to the country music, the more you found that you lost your dog, you lost your truck, you lost your gun. If you play it you're backwards, you might get it all back. And then, and then I discovered that life with God was what I wanted. And I started pursuing it, and it became more. Then guess what? As I grew in Christ, I became a better husband. I became a better father. I became a better man. You know why I carry the testimony I do in this valley? Because it's not my testimony I carry, it's his. And all I have to do is walk with him, and he does the rest. I don't have to pretend. I don't have to push. I have to dwell with him. He does it all. New life. The life that I have now is far far better than the dreams I had. Now, I don't necessarily know if I'd be a pastor knowing what I know now going into it. Because it can be difficult. But I'll tell you, the life coming out of it is far better than I could have ever imagined. How many guys ever had like this perfect image of marriage growing up? This is what I want. How, how would you like to know that the reality can surpass the dream? Because that's exactly what it did for me. The reality actually surpassed the dream. And it can when you bring God into it. 
And the resurrection declares that we can have new life so I don't have to be the same again. I don't have to live in the same disappointments. I don't have to live in the manipulation and control of others because my Savior rose again. I can follow him. And wherever he goes, I can go with him. That's the truth. And the truth will set us free. The same Jesus who turned water into wine can transform your home, your life, your family, and your future. Transform. You know what I don't like about the term Christian? Because we use it in a negative light. That we use it just as a means of identification, but not a means of transformation. You know why he died? Not just to get us into heaven. You know how I know that? Because the moment you had accepted him, he would have taken you home. He died to transform your life so that you could be a witness in this world. Transformed. You know what transformed mean? means? That word transformed is the Greek word metamorphosis. It's the same idea of as, a, as a caterpillar turning into a butterfly. And you may have walked in here like a caterpillar, weighed down and walking, barely able to crawl. Guess what? He is going to transform your life and make you fly if you give him permission. Because my Jesus can do it. My Jesus could even do it. Because you know what it says? It says that death didn't take him. He gave his life over and he took it back again. I don't know any person in history that could die and take up their own life and bring it back. But you can when you're God Almighty. Guess what? God Almighty lives in you when you have Jesus Christ. He says, we are a temple of the Holy Spirit. My life doesn't have to be the same. It doesn't have to be the same. If I could preach this on the mountaintops, you don't have to be the same. You can live a glorious, resurrected, powerful life in Jesus if you would only submit. You don't have to go through this life, going through the same troubles over and over and over again, looking for a different result and being disappointed when you don't get it. I can walk out of here new because that is the new life that he's given me and he's given us. So with that, God gives us new life to do what? To do something with it. Back to this passage. This passage says, go and make disciples. Brother, if you could play softly, or Debbie, just play softly for me. Um, he gave us new life to do something with it. And you know how we do something with it? When we go out and make disciples. When we go out and be a part of the solution instead of creating more problems. Jesus said, I'm going to go and I'm going to give you power and authority. Go and make disciples. And so that is our goal. That is our life dream is to bring other people into the reality that they can have new life too. It's needed today. It really, really is needed. So Matthew 28, 18 says, Go and make disciples, teaching them to what? Observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always. Brothers and sisters, I know many of us have received Christ in here. There may be a few that haven't. And we're going to focus on what he wants to do with our life more than just saying a prayer. We want to focus on what he wants to do. 11. 10 and 11. That should be 10. All right. So with that, we have more sound difficulties. I'm telling you, it's been a rough day. Here's the truth. Christ has given us all authority to make a difference. Are you making a difference with what you have been given? Are you making a difference with it? Are you taking this life that he's given you and are you burying it in the sand? Or are you investing it into other people? When we look at this generation that we have in our country right now and many of us are distraught over what's going on, right? You know who we can blame? Ourselves. Because we didn't step up and we didn't teach them the things of God. The world taught them. 
What do we need to do? We need to transform so that we can go be witnesses and we can bring people, people into the reality that they can have new life. The reality that things can be different, that they don't have to live the same. That you can have a future and hope that you can be fulfilled. That you don't have to be controlled by money or the power of it. You don't have to be controlled by your job. Even though you have to go there, it doesn't have to control you. Because there's one who stands in authority above it all. Above it all. That's why we do this. That's why we talk about Jesus. Because Jesus wants to transform your life. He wants to make something beautiful out of it. You made a mess of it, but he's going to make it a beautiful thing. He brought me into the reality of loving other people. You know what? I couldn't love other people. I couldn't. I couldn't love other people because I was too busy loving myself. And then I got a hold of him, and he showed me true love, and he says, no, you need to give it out. And this is what I found. The more I give it out, the more it returns to me. So now my life is spent giving out the love of God and dwelling with Him in security. You came here today not by accident. You came because God has a purpose for you to hear this message and to do something with it. And you might have been going through life on the short end, but there's new life for you here today if you'd only receive it. So with that, every head bowed, every eye closed. Father, we come to you in Jesus' name, and we thank you, God. We thank you that we can have new life because the resurrection declares something great and glorious before us. And there's many here, Lord, today. They might have received you, but they've been walking in their own strength. They've been walking in the world, and the world's been controlling them. And, Lord, they need a touch. They need to be renewed. They need to live in the new life that you purchased for them. And if that's you here today, would you just raise your hand? Oh, acknowledge that. Amen. 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 Because this new life is available, and all you have to do is just reach out and receive it by faith. By faith, you can have it. So, Lord, I thank you that you've called us here to listen to you speak that there is a change coming and that we can live in glory. Pray that you release that by the power of your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Remember, uh, there's going to be people here praying for you. Uh, there's the crosses up here to take pictures. If we could all rise, let's close them. Oh, sorry. We need to do our offering. I tell you, I, I get sidetracked. So, Father, we thank you for the offering. We pray, God, that it would glorify you, and we thank you for this full house in Jesus' name. So they're going to do the offering. And... Uh, Thank you very much for coming out today because this is a day to truly celebrate. Go ahead. Sit down. So I shared this with the group this morning. Um, Thursday, we went to Medieval Times. How many of you guys ever been to Medieval Times? So we're watching them go at it, slashing each other, I wanted a sword. They didn't give me one. I thought I could chase my wife around with it, but that didn't work. So we're watching this thing, and they're and they're and they're having this fight. And as they're having this fight, one knight wins, right? And he comes over, and he and he wins the scarf from the queen. And he comes over, and there's this little girl. And I think it's her birthday, and it's a special function. It's this little girl. And so he comes and he and, and he gives the scarf to this little girl. And then then they made her like like queen, queen of love and queen of kindness in the kingdom, right? In the realm. And the whole time God was saying, This is Jesus who fought on our behalf so that we could have honor in the kingdom. He fought on our behalf so that we could have honor in his kingdom. The Savior that we have is not a victim. We don't look at the cross and we don't say, oh, Jesus is a victim of my sin. No. 
Jesus took our sin so that he could be the ultimate, superior, complete victor in all of our lives. And we can have victory in him. What a wonderful Savior. May you have a great Easter this week. Let us all stand and let's worship the Lord. Resurrection Day. 
Remember, he is living. He rose and he's living inside of each one of us. Hallelujah.